Man, thank you all, worship team. Thank you for leading us. Uh, we, we, were, we were practicing and singing that song. I don't know, Pastor Justin, it was the other morning we were singing Refining Fire on, on, on uh, a, a morning um, of our prayer and fasting, and, and uh, we were bringing Matt in, and, and I, I had uh, just really been touched by that song, and really God began to prepare my heart for tonight with that song, the song we just sang. And uh, I didn't know, and, and Matt didn't know that we were singing that. Matt gets on the phone with Justin and says, hey, we need to drop in the song Refining Fire into the set list. Is it in the set list for tonight? And he was like, no, it's not. And, and Justin said, did you talk to Pastor Jamie? And he was like, no, I didn't talk to Pastor Jamie. I talked to Jesus. <laughs> and so, and so we, put this, we put that song in, and I really believe it's a, it's a prophetic moment for us and for our house, for you and for your life tonight. And I tell you, I promise you, hell is scared. Hell is nervous that we're together like this, asking God to do work in our life and do work in our heart. Leviticus 6, 9 through 13, it's an interesting scripture. And I'm going to read two passages of scripture, this one in Leviticus, and then uh, I'm going to get into Genesis a little bit where uh, Abraham goes to offer his son Isaac. Many of you know the story. This is what it says about the priest. Then the Lord said to Moses, give Aaron and his sons the following instructions regarding the burnt offering. We're talking about fire tonight. The burnt offering must be left on top of the altar until the next morning, and the fire on the altar must be kept burning all night. Somebody say all night. All night. In the morning after the priest on duty has put on his official linen clothing and linen undergarments. Come on, put on his Lulu. Come on, he got some Lulu on. He must clean out the ashes of the burnt offering and put them beside the altar. Then he must take off these garments, change back into his regular clothes, and carry the ashes outside the camp to a place that is ceremonially clean. Meanwhile, the fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must never go out. Each morning, the priest will add fresh wood to the fire and arrange the burnt offering on it. He will then burn the fat of the peace offerings on it. Remember, the fire must be kept burning on the altar at all times. It must never go out. I got a silly title for tonight, Crock-Pot Christianity. <laughs> Crock-Pot Christianity. Let me pray for you real quick. Father, I pray that you would just be here tonight. And you're already here. You're already burning up things and burning in things and burning out things. And Lord, this is an altar. This whole room is a holy ground, a holy place. Thank you for your mercy to allow us to converse with you. Allow us to be changed and transformed and, and into your image, God. Thank you. With unveiled face, Paul said in Corinthians, with unveiled face, we get to look on you, Jesus, and be changed. Thank you for the mirror of your word tonight. It doesn't show us who we aren't. It shows us who you are and that we can become more like you as we see you because we become what we behold. I pray we see you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Crop pop. Christianity. Before I jump in, I want to give honor where honors due. My good friends, uh, pastors Melissa and Jason Creech are here uh, from a church called Home in Strawberry Plains. Love you so much. Faithful in the city, faithful to the call of God. We've been friends from day one when, when we moved. He's, he's got, they have a prophetic call in their life. He's got, a, he's got that prophet stare. When you look at him, you just want to repent. You're like, man, I didn't do it. I'm sorry. We have our first breakfast at First Watch, I looked across the table and the fire of God was in his eyes and I just started repenting and confessing and stuff. And uh, that's really what tonight's about, Crock-Pot Christianity. We're going to present our lives to God at the end of our service tonight for the year. And um, I grew up on TV dinners. Come on, anybody? Anybody, anybody grow up on some Salisbury steak? Come on, somebody. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, Jordan. Come on, Salisbury steak and, and some corn over there in the corner and some mashed potatoes in the other corner and the little brownie in the other corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You throw that thing in the microwave for about, you know, 42 minutes and it's still frozen solid. You put it in there and you poke holes in the cellophane and then, and then all of a sudden it cooks and you turn it and you cook it again and then it looks like it's just got like little dew dripping off the cellophane, the plastic. You peel back the wrapper of the plastic and then all of a sudden you, you look at this piping hot meal. You're like, oh, you, you go to bite into it and ka-kink, you just break your tooth on something frozen right in the middle of the brownie. Uh, the crock pot cooking, when I met my wife, she she cooks with this thing called a crock pot. I never heard of one before I got married. And literally, like, this thing was a pressure cooker and a heat cooker. And, the, and she would go and she would get all the vegetables ready the night before and get all the meat and get all of the seasoning and the spices. And she'd put all this stuff into this pot. And it looked, didn't, didn't look great at all. And then she'd put the lid on and she'd hit this, you know, this Star Wars mechanism. 
just close around it, and then she would hit the right temperature and the right pressure, and, and, and that thing would begin to cook, and it would begin to cook and cook all night long. The next morning, she'd come in, she'd hit the little button, and psh, release all the steam and all the pressure in the house. The house would begin to smell like a symphonic expression of heaven. You'd bite into it, and there's an angelic symphony of flavors in your mouth. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? You, you would bite in, and, and, and the, the whole entire thing was piping hot from the outside to the inside. It, was, it tasted the same from the outside to the inside. There was no frozen middle. There was no cold center. There was no cold hard heart. It was, it was such a good meal because it had cooked all night long under the pressure and in the confines of the crock pot. I think God is looking for some people that are tired of microwave Christianity that are tired of being okay with the quick fix and the quick thing and the hit the button for four minutes and, and, it's, just, and, 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 and it's okay and it looks hot on the outside, but, but it's cold on the inside. It, it looks warm and it looks piping hot, but the reality is so often the inside of our hearts are still kind of cold. I think God wants to get some crock pot Christian somebody. I, I, think, I think God wants to get some, let me say it this way, some well done Christians. Because God never says thank you. He says, well done. He says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. What's well done? Well done is when the inside is the same temperature as the outside. Well done is when we've been able to go into the fire and the pressure and the heat of life. When we've been, been able to walk in the flames and, and get inside some stuff and allow the pressure to begin to do something on the inside of our heart and we begin to be cooked in a way that when the world goes to taste and see if God is good, they don't bite into a cold heart. They don't bite into a cold Christian. They don't bite into something frozen on the inside. They bite into something that's well done on the inside and the outside. They say, wow, God is good. It's an amazing flavor. There's this heart of God, I believe, looking for well-done Christians. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. The story, the priest, it says they have to leave the burnt offering on the altar all night long until the next morning, all night long. Number one, very simple thought, there's no medium rare Jesus. There's just not. Like You might want your, I like my steak medium rare too when I eat steak four years ago. I haven't eaten it in a while. Look at somebody and say, well done, please. Well done, please. How, how would you like it? I, well done, please. How would you have your order? Well, well done. Well done, ma'am. Well, well done. So I, I, please, I'll have that well done. I, I'd like that well done. I know that's a blasphemy for some of you restaurant goers. I understand. I see you shaking your head, Gwen. It's blasphemy for me, too, if I was eating a filet mignon. But I'm talking about the heart of humanity right now. Well done, please. <laughs> I get it. I would have been beat to, to order a well-done steak when I was a kid. The reality is God is looking for us that we can get into the heat of life. We can stay on the altar through the night season. It says that it had to stay on the altar all night long. Can I just say this is not a quick process? This is not an overnight thing. This is not a quick Christianity fix where you go to church and everything's better in a day. It's not I tithe one time and everything's perfect. It's not that I decide to go to church. For you. No, this is a lifelong thing on the altar and fire of God. This is a commitment to go through seasons and to go through dark, dark moments and to go through pressure and to go through pain and to go through things that would actually begin to prepare my heart to be well done, thy good and faithful servant. There's this this heart of God, it says, leave it on the altar all night. This is an altar today. This is an altar tonight. It says in the morning, just a couple quick thoughts. In the morning, it tells the priest they got to change clothes. And it says, take the ashes from the last night's sacrifice and move it outside of the camp to a clean place. Jesus went outside of the camp to a cross, to a place that we can take the ashes. I wrote it this way. Well done living is a daily decision. Every single morning, the priest had to go and get the ashes. They had to change clothes and, and get the ashes and take the, the heap of ashes, the heap of yesterday's offering, the heap of yesterday's offenses, the heap of yesterday's peace offering, the heap of everything that they burnt the day before to, to satisfy God. And they had to take those ashes and move them outside of the camp to a place that was clean. That's the cross of God. That you can literally take the ashes of yesterday's offering and yesterday's hurt and yesterday's offenses and yesterday's pain. The stuff that we go through, if we're going to be on the altar, you can take that and literally take it to the cross of Jesus. Here's why they had to take the ashes outside. Because ashes hinder heat. 
If you ever, come on, I had an old Weber grill. Anybody cook on the old Weber grills? Come on, where my, where my men at? I'm talking before, before gas and electric stuff. Come on, charcoal, briquette people. Where my briquette men at? You take some, you know what I'm talking about, Nick. You made some brisket. You probably made it on briquettes tonight. We're going to have some briquette brisket tonight. That, that, that you would cook, I would, I would make steak, I would put this charcoal in, it would burn down, and I would get lazy. And, and come on, where, and I wouldn't take the ashes out of the grill. And I'd make another fire, and I'd make another fire, and I'd cook two or three times until the ashes piled up so high that it was actually hindering the heat to cook the meat the way it was supposed to be cooked. And, and, and what happens is if we don't actually remove the ashes, the fire and breath of God, the, the, fire, the breath of God that gets the flames heated up, it hinders. You have to remove some stuff from your life and take it to the cross so God can breathe on and the, the ashes won't smother the fire of God in your life. He says, take the ashes out every day. Remove the ashes from yesterday's sacrifice. I need fresh wind. I need fresh fire on my life today. He says, meanwhile, the fire is on the altar. It must be kept burning. It must never go out. It must be, be, be given wood every morning to, to be arranged so the fire is, is lit. It must never go out. The, the fire that originally hit this altar of God came from heaven. This, this is not a man-made fire they're talking about. This is a fire that came from heaven. Literally, God started the fire and it came from heaven. The next thing I, I need you to know that they were in charge of bringing wood every morning. Well done living is more about the fuel than it is the fire. It's, it's more about the fuel. Every morning, fresh wood. Every morning, the priest had to chop wood. Come on, I, anybody ever had a wood-burning stove? I had one growing up. I hated it. Because all I did was chop wood, look for wood, cut wood, chop wood, look for wood, stack wood, dry wood, look for wood. It's like, can I do anything? Just, it, anybody watch the show alone, or the show home? I wouldn't have made it as a homesteader. I wouldn't have made it. I'd have died. I, I would have, pre-electric days, pre, I'm dead. You're like, you'd adapt it. No, I wouldn't have. I would not have adapted. I watched the show, show alone where they go out and they have to survive by themselves and like in a, in a barren, you know, Siberian eat you environment. Like, you know, I, I, and, and the very first thing they do, Sam, you know, you're an outdoorsman, you're a Marine. The very first thing they would do is they have to get fire. They have, they have to make fire. It's like, it's food and fire. Those are the two essentials, right, for them to live. And water, obviously, but they, 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 they go, if we get a fire, we can survive. If we make a fire, well, what do they go to do? They have the fire in their pocket. They have, the, they have the flame, they have the spark, they have the fire. They have to go begin to get wood and dry wood and gather wood and store wood and do everything they can. Fuel is a necessity for fire. And I think as the church, hear me, this is important. I think as church, as Christian people, I'm guilty of it. I think we pray for fire all the time. God, your fire. God, your, your power. God, your fire. And he's like, I've got plenty of fire. I, I've got an eternal flame. I need fuel. I need your life. I need you at the altar. I need that thing that you're holding. That's fuel for my fire. I will start a fire. I will burn a fire. But I need some fuel from your life. It says every morning they had to actually go and put fuel on the fire. Your smartphone would go out without fuel. Let me make it modern for you. My kids have have charging etiquette with their smartphones. I never knew it was such a thing. And they begin to fight about, hey, I need the charger, I need the charger, I need the charger, I need the charger, I get the charger, I get the charger. What percentage are you? I'm like, that's the thing. They're like, I'm 7%, I'm 4%, I get the charger. We've invented, we've, what if we were that worried about getting the fuel in our own life? What, what if we were that worried about getting the, something to God when we're trying to get charged? What if we're that worried about inventing devices to plug in in every apparatus and every place in our life? And we're going to get fuel. Come on, we're going to get the fuel of family and relationships and church. We're going to get the fuel of whatever it is in our life that God needs for fuel at an altar. I don't know what God's speaking to you about your own life right now, but I promise you there's fuel in your life. We need to be more about fuel than we are about the fire. You want the fire of God in your life this year? Begin to find what God wants as fuel. 
Begin, begin to find what you can put on an altar tonight when we have a prayer service and anointing time. Say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give my whole life to you, but God, here, here's something that I'm gonna let you have as fuel. Genesis 22, and I'm gonna wrap up. Genesis 22, you know the story of Abraham. Abraham gets this child, it's a promised child. I'm not even gonna read the whole thing to you. Many of you know the story. Uh, this promised son named Isaac. At one point when Isaac, <clears throat> many believe, is 30 years old. He's not 12, he's not 13, he's not 50. He's probably 30 years old. Abraham says, I got it. He hears God. God says, I want you to go and take and sacrifice your son, Isaac. And the Bible says that Abraham gets his son, Isaac, and several servants. And he gets this wood, and he gets this fire, and he gets this knife. It, it's a picture of the cross and the Holy Spirit and the word of God, the knife, the cutting away. It's a picture of those three things, the cross and the spirit and the word of God. He gets those three. He gets two servants, and they go to a distant land, and they come to this mountain, and there's the mountain that he's going to sacrifice his son. Isaac, knowing they've done this before, they've made sacrifices, he looks at his dad, and he says, Dad, I see you got the wood, and I see you got the fire, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham prophetically says, Son, God will provide the sacrifice. God will handle the sacrifice. And so he puts his son on the altar. He ties him up hand and foot, lays him there, begins to light the fire, lifts the knife to sacrifice his son. And an angel says, stop. And now I see what's in your heart. Now I see what's, what's going on. I see a well done heart, Abraham. I see a heart that believes. And so the Bible tells him that to stop and you're obedient. You've passed the test. And then he looks behind him and there's a, a ram in the thicket, and God says that I've got the supplied provision, and then Abraham sacrifices the ram and then calls God for the first time in the Bible, Jehovah Jireh. You know the song we sing, Jireh, right? It's the first time it's ever mentioned. I, I want to point several things out to you. In this passage of Scripture, the first time the word worship is ever used is right here in this story. There's no song sung. There's no band, there's no drums, there's no guitar, there's no singing, there's only sacrifice. Abraham says, the boy and I are gonna go worship and we'll come back to you. I just want you to know that, that sacrifice in your life this year, whatever that looks like, is worship. That you don't need a song, you don't need to sing. Literally, worship is more about, I love singing. Come on, I'll be the first on my face. I'll be the first singing. I think praise invites God into our presence. I think worship and sacrifice invites us into his. I think worship invites us into his presence. Literally, where, where we begin to sacrifice and, and you begin to say, God, here's my life. It's a living sacrifice. We'll look at Romans 12 here in a minute. But that, that verse where we give our life, they come. It's so much more about sacrifice than it is singing when it comes to worship. It says he ties his son to the altar and Abraham's God's friend and God invites him into a sacrificial moment of worship. Takes his only son. It's a picture of Jesus. Can you imagine Mr. Abraham talking to Miss Abraham? Like, hey, mama, I know we've been believing for this house, this son, this promise, this vacation, this city, this new whatever. It is. I know we've been believing and God gave us this blessing, but I got to go sacrifice it. She's like, okay. Go do what you've got to do. And they take the young man to offer him. Write this down. God never asks for something you don't want. That, that, he, that would be called spring cleaning. God, if you, if you, don't, if you don't want it, it's not worship. I was that chubby kid in elementary that was kind of a bully. And if I saw something in your lunch plate that I wanted, y'all know, know the trick. Y'all know the kid, right? Do you want that? You just jam your finger right through the, through the roll. Put your finger right through the brownie. Do you want that? What do they say every time? I did. I, I think God is coming into some of our life going, do you want that? I did. <laughs> do, do, you, do you want that? 
I did. I think God has the right to put his finger on anything and go, do you want that? And I don't think he puts his finger on stuff we don't want. I don't think he puts his finger on the broccoli somebody. I think he puts his finger on the brownie. I think, I think he says, do you want that? I think he's saying to us this year and to me this year, do you want that in your life or do you want me? My kids, here's the thing. Obedience is all about trust. It's Friday night. Are y'all okay to stay here for a while? I mean, we're, we're here. We might as well stay. We might as well heat it up a little bit, right? I, I, I mean, sacrifice and, and the test that God asks us to go through. It, literally, he's saying, I want you to worship me. And if you don't want it, it's not worship. And so we're willing to sacrifice some things this year, Lord. We're willing to allow you to put your finger on some things this year, Lord. We're willing to, to let some things happen. The, the servants are, are there with Abraham. They say, hey, where are you going? Abraham says, hey, stay here with the donkeys. We're going over here to worship. Can, can I tell you that if you're truly going to have a life of sacrifice, it's going to take some separation. And there might be some people in your life that need to stay with the donkeys. <laughs> there, 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 there might, y'all got scared, didn't you? There might, be, there might be some people that you need to say, you know what? You go ahead and stay with the donkeys. You, you go ahead and stay with the mules because I'm actually going to take steps to worship this year in my life. I'm actually going to take steps to sacrifice. And so I just think that, that sacrifice is, 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 is really what worship is. And in order to worship in a certain way, it's going to require some separation. Uh, literally, there cannot be worship without some separation in your life. I don't know what it is that you need to let be on the altar and separate from your life today. Faith will always bring you to a place of separation. I know the things that God's speaking to me about this year to separate from and they separate, and now it's just the dad and the boy, and they go up the hill, and Abraham, Isaac gets scared and says, what's going to happen, dad, and what, where, what are we going to do? He says, God will provide. God will provide. Isaac says, okay. N- another thought, and Isaac being 30 years old, he could have easily probably beat his 90-year-old dad up. At this point, probably a 100-year-old dad. I mean, I'd have been fighting. Come on, anybody would have been tied up and put on that stack of wood. Can anybody? You know, I, I, I just, it's not. But, but he allowed, he said, okay, dad. Sacrifice, I'm gonna say a cuss word, okay? Prepare yourself. <laughs> uh, it's gonna be, it's a big cuss word. It's a horrific word. And you, and you might not ever come back here. Sacrifice requires Submission. It's the S word. Can, can you say it? Some of you can't even say it. Submission. 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 God, I don't want you to put your finger on that. I don't want you to take that. I don't, God, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I even trust you. And, and, and then when Abraham finally raises the knife to kill his son and to do it, God says, I don't want the blood of your son. The blood of my son will do the blood of my son will make the way. It's okay. I don't need that. Well, then, God, why did you ask for all this stuff if you didn't want it in the first place? Because it was a test to see what's in your heart. Hear me. The test of obedience always has to do with faith. It always has to do with trust. When I go out to dinner with my kids when they were younger, they would have their dessert, and I would always test them. I'd say, let me get a bite of that cake. And it took, I never got a bite. <laughs> But I, I, I wanted just one time for one of them to go, Dad, take half the cake. I was prepared to buy every cake in the restaurant. I was prepared to provide for them everything they could eat in that restaurant. Every time I'm like, and I would do it. I would say, hey, let me have a bite. And they'd be like, no, Dad, this is mine. I said, let me have a bite. No, Dad, you bought this. is my cake. This is mine. I'm like, let me have a bite. Just get, I'd, I'd be like, test, try me. See, see what I'm going to do. Te- you know me. You know, I bought you that. I bought that for you. Like, check, just, just try me. Just see what I'll do. I never got a bite. <laughs> Maybe my daughter gave me a tiny bite. And she said, no, I didn't. But the whole, the whole time, they wanted to hold on to what was in their hand because they didn't believe what was in my heart. And, and when it comes to sacrifice this year, I'm just asking me and I'm asking you, would you trust what's in God's heart more than what's in your hand? We hold on to our hang-ups, our hurts, our fears, our offenses. We hold on to the things that make us comfortable and secure. We hold on to things because 
we don't fully trust his heart. And, and this is all about a, a trust test. Do you, do you believe God? Not, not believe in God. Satan and the demons believe in God and tremble. They have a Pentecostal experience. Ooh. <laughs> they tremble. They believe in God. Do you believe God? Do you, do you believe the word? Do you believe that when he says, test me and, and sacrifice this and, Lay down that attitude. Lay down that fear. Lay down. Come on, the young lady that told me the story about laying down anxiety and taking steps publicly into a public tank to get in that water and lay down her fear and anxiety and watched what God did and met her in that tank. That's an altar. That's a memorial stone in her life that will change generations and children. As she tells that story, it's going to change a church. God, I trust what's in your heart more than what's in my hand. If the worship team would come, we're going to. Go back into some worship tonight. and We might sing that song, Light a Fire. I just, I just, as we walk by faith and we believe God, the next thing that happens is this. He goes to do what he's supposed to do. God says, I see your heart. And then it says he turns around and there's a ram in the thicket. And then he calls the place, God shall provide. So, so I, want, I just want to tell you this. God will meet you. He's already provided before you ever even get there. So the thing you're contemplating tonight about, do I want to give that to God? Do I want to do that this year? Do I want to come up and get prayed for and anointed for the, for the year? Do I want to, do, what does that look like? The thing that you're already contemplating, Abraham is coming up one side of the mountain with his son, and a ram is coming up the other side of the mountain to get into a thicket at the same time. God already has it answered before you ask the question. He already has provided for you when you get there. It's already taken care of. And literally, when you move into a posture of sacrifice, God says, I will provide every single thing that you've been holding on to too tightly. I will take care of it. I am Jehovah Jireh. Romans 12 2 says, present your, li- your lives as a living sacrifice. I think we have it in the message version. Would you stand to your feet with me? Would the ushers come on forward? We're going to go into a moment. Just uh, We have this every year, just an anointing time. I just felt like this year is a year of saying, God, I, I want to give you my life. Well done. I-, I want the inside of my heart to match the outside of my life. I want, I want my heart to lead my head. I-, I want what you do in my life. I know it might get hot. I know you might need to put your finger on something right now tonight. I know you might need to kill something, but this is an altar, oh God. If you need to kill it, kill it. If you need me to surrender it, I'll surrender it. If you want to put your finger on it, I'll I'll put your finger on it, oh God. Here is my life this year. God, I'm giving you my kids and my family and and the weight that I carry. I'm walking by faith. I believe that you got me covered. There's a lamb in the thicket. The whole story was a picture of Jesus. Jesus provided everything you and I need. Therefore, we can let go of anything we think we can't. God, I'm giving you my life tonight. When Jesus was sacrificed on the cross... His flesh was sacrificed. The moment he was ripped in two, the glory of God was revealed. The minute you decide to put your life on the altar and begin to be a sacrifice, the glory of God begins to be revealed in your life. And tonight, I believe the glory of God is going to shine through your life for this entire year. I'm praying for an entire year for God to mark your life and, and burn your life with his image in his his hand i'm going to anoint these guys with oil i'm just going to pray over them i think my wife's going to help me we're going to anoint these guys with oil and i'm just going to pray for them come on because it's not about me our prayer team this ministry team they're amazing ministers that listen to god and i'm going to pray over them and then they're going to pray for you and we're going to have certain lines down here in each of these rows you can just bring you and your wife or you and your girlfriend or you by yourself or you with your kids if your kids are in here and you can and just just we're going to we're going to do Romans 12 would you put it on the screen for me real quick Romans 12 too this is what we're going to do it says this it says so so here's what i want you to do god helping you god helping me Come on, we need mercy to do this. Take your, listen to this, take your everyday ordinary life. All right, (laughs) next one. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you, take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Offerings go on altars. 
Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Come on, giving him all of the weight, giving him all of the problem, giving him all of the year, giving him everything is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to the culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Come on, there's some separation. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Well done. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, bringing you up to who he is. I, I, I just believe it's a holy night, and I'm going to pray over these guys, and I'm praying for the year, and I'm so thankful for you being here tonight. I'm so thankful that you're here, Pastor Matt. Thanks for hanging out, and let's anoint these guys with oil, and just make this an altar.